Okay, I've been trying to make this for a lot of days now, and the ideal situation hasn't presented itself, so I thought I'll just go ahead. <clears throat> uh, a lot of background noise. Hey, can't help it. This I got to do this. Um, the horrifying situation in Israel. Uh, people are missing the boat on this. And things are going according to plan. <clears throat> I mean by that, uh, the, um, the plan of the occulted oligarchy, which is to embroil the entire world in an enormous conflagration over this, because we're pointing the fingers, our fingers in the wrong directions and we seem to have forgotten our history. And the British have largely been able to uh, go back and kind of scrub themselves from, from historical, general historical knowledge to a large extent. And I wanted, I found this article from 2009. I'm still relying very heavily on uh, executive intelligence review because it's just simply the best. <clears throat> I try to supplement it, I look around, I. I'm very open to new leads and new ideas, and I keep coming back. Uh, at least for this kind of thing, uh, EIR is, is still the best. And this article is not that old. Um, so I've been telling people I was going to make a, a video that elucidates my claims about how the British are today, even today, continuing to pull the strings on everything that we're seeing with the intention it, it looks as though they're trying to, to lead the world into a world war. And notice that no one, almost no one, only very, only the very few who are astute or, uh, you know, I have a friend, a uh, very dear friend who's from Yemen, and uh, once he said to me, I was saying, are people aware of the, the British role in the Middle East and uh, throughout most of the developing world? And he said, yes, uh, we're all aware. We know it's them. We know who's doing it. But we keep falling for it every time. Uh, he said, they are so clever. And indeed, we're seeing, of course, you know, in my mind, anybody who is taking the side of Israel at this point is uh, not even human. I think they're, if they are human, they're possessed by some demon. Uh, they're ghouls. And I have no respect for anyone who supports Israel. And I don't care what anybody has to say about that. Uh, that being said, I'm also aware that Hamas is a creation of British intelligence. The entire situation there has been rigged and the real victims, of course, are the Palestinian people. And the situation there has been, uh, in the modern sense, has been rigged since uh, the eight, 1840s. My sense is the British have created a situation, per the perfect storm, uh, as it were, where you have to take a side where the entire world will be split along these lines and that the passions will run high. Uh, it's impossible for me to stand back and say, well, you know, both sides, it's a complicated issue. It's not a complicated issue at all. Uh, I would modify, um, I would diverge, I think, from the average supporter of Palestinians in the sense that I'm aware that the real enemy is is uh, British imperialism that's still very much alive today, stronger than ever in my view. So I wanted to back that up and read this article. Um, it is time to bury the brutish empire. This is from January 23rd, 2009. British Deception Responsible for Palestinian Bloodshed Today by Hussein Askari. Preface. The history of the British manipulation of the Arabs and Jews is 
As the incredible suffering of the people of Gaza tests today, a sad story. It is a pathetic one, too, because the world and the involved parties who have failed to understand the evil nature of the British Empire and thus failed to react decisively to its machinations before, during, and after World War I have failed even now to correct that mistake. The British Empire and its servants in the consecutive British governments have been masters of deception, as we will see in the brief report below. Can you imagine the butcher of Baghdad, Tony Blair, as a peace broker in Southwest Asia now? How could the USA, Europe, Russia, and the UN, the quartet of the Middle East, be so collectively insane as to accept Blair as their guide through the dense underbrush of the British-created Middle East? As was the case in 1919, before the British put their Sykes-Picot knives to use against the people of Southwest Asia with the help of the French imperialists, people in the region are pleading to and giving the new U.S. presidency another chance to help mend what has been broken. Although a lot of blood has been spilled, and although the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the Balfour Declaration cannot be reversed, there is still a chance for another piece of Westphalia to preserve and promote the true nature of the human race in place of the bestiality of the brutish empire which is being exhibited on the television screens every day. So, here we are, 14 years later. Nothing's changed, it's worse than ever. Master puppeteers. The British Empire, while fostering wild Zionist madness, simultaneously promoted Islamic fanaticism in order to play the two, not only against each other, but also against other legitimate nationalist and anti-imperialist forces. Take note of that. Let me read that again. The British Empire, while fostering wild Zionist madness, simultaneously promoted Islamic fanaticism in order to play the two, not only against each other, but also against other legitimate nationalist anti-imperialist forces. The case of the creation and manipulation of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and elsewhere is a perfect example. See British Saudi pan-Islamism, British Britain's assault on the Muslim nation states in the world, EIR, December 26, 2008. An interesting case involving a Palestinian figure is al Haj Amin al Husseini. Al Husseini, who started as an opponent of the British occupation of Palestine after 1917, fled the British forces into exile in 1920, only to be pardoned by the British and brought back a year later, and even succeeded in becoming the Mufti of Jerusalem in 1921 with British approval following the death of his brother, the previous Mufti. The purpose of this move was to create a fanatic Islamic counter gang to the British created Jaco Jabot sorry, Jabotinskyite fascist Jewish groups. See accompanying article. What was pushed aside with this orchestrated conflict were the true anti-imperialist forces. One famous confrontation between Mufti Al-Amin Al-Husseini and the Palestinian nationalist leader, Abdul Qadir Al-Hussein, from another distinguished Jerusalem family, who was leading the resistance against the British, tells it all. The Mufti is reported to have told Al-Husseini, why don't you go and fight the British? and leave me to fight the Jews. In Egypt, the British commissioner from 1883 to 1907, Lord Cromer, Evelyn Baring of the powerful Baring banking family, had used Islamic fundamentalists in a similar way to prevent the growth of anti-British nationalist movements. Sheikh Mohammed Abdul, 1849 to 1905, had participated in the 1882 revolt 
led by Egyptian officer Ahmed Urabi against the British control of Egypt's government. He was sent into exile in Lebanon, where he stayed until 1884, when he was invited to France by Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. The French, who were in conflict with the British over the Middle East, recruited the two to a French Freemasonic lodge and paid them to launch anti-British propaganda. Abdu, like al-Husseini later, was pardoned by Krumer and appointed as Grand Mufti of Egypt in 1889 after after promising Cromer to collaborate with the British to make the relationship of the British bloodsuckers with their victims, the Egyptian farmers, more, quote, civilized and orderly. Abdu's role was to cool down the nationalist aspiration for freedom. His biographers report that despite his rabid racism, Cromer considered Abdu a close friend. Abdu's, quote, political ideas later had a great impact on the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Hassan al-Banna, and his successor, Sayyid Qutb. What the Brotherhood learned from Abdu is to be quote, pragmatic and to collaborate with whoever, with whomever provides weapons and support. This way, it turned itself into a tool of the British Empire from that day to this. Interestingly, three leaders of the most active Brotherhood organization still live in exile in Britain today. Ali al-Bayanuni, Syria, Rashid al-Ganoushi, Tunis, and Kamal al-Halabawi, Egypt. They are all still active in subversive activities against their own governments. The Islamic resistance movement of Palestine, Hamas, was originally an outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood, and its founder, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, was a prominent leader of the International Brotherhood. The purpose of Hamas, in the eyes of the Israeli leaders who facilitated its growth in the 1980s, was to undermine the legitimate anti-colonial forces of the PLO and its leader, Yasser Arafat, in the occupied territories. This was a copy of the British policy. Hope of American intervention against the British. This refers to a time when the United States was still independent. Um, when the Arab peoples learned of the secret Anglo-French Sykes-Picot agreement at the end of World War I, they reacted with anger and frustration. Arab tribal leaders had helped the British and their allies in the war against the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which was in control of the greater part of the Arab Middle East because Britain had promised to give them freedom and independence as Arab nations after the war. What followed was a two-pronged British-French policy of brutal repression and a masterly divide-and-conquer strategy. Violent revolts took place between 1920 and 1925 throughout the region against the British and the French. But before that, regional leaders had looked forward to getting help from the United States, which they regarded as a true republic with no imperialist ambitions. On the 8th of January, 1918, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson addressed a joint session of Congress his speech included a 14-point declaration of what he called, quote, the only possible program, unquote, to achieve world peace and justice in the post-war era. That declaration included the demand of, quote, affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike, unquote. An Arabic copy of Wilson's declaration was secretly distributed in Arab countries in October of the same year. Point 12 received special attention. Quote, the Turkish portion 
of the present Ottoman Empire should be assured a secure sovereignty, but the other nationalities which are now under Turkish rule should be assured an undoubted security of life and an absolutely unmolested opportunity of autonomous development." Unquote. This point was regarded as an explicit American endorsement of the independence of the nations now occupied by the British and French troops. The two imperial powers issued public statements assuring the United States and the people of the region that this was their aim too. However, their intentions were quite the opposite. In spite of British assurances, people in the region did not trust these claims and later reported to the U.S. through the American King Crane Commission their disapproval of any British mandate to control their countries and instead asked for the United States to protect their interests. Betrayal. However, the King Crane mission was betrayed and its reports suppressed. The British orchestrated phony referenda in Iraq showing that the Iraqi people were eager to have British masters run their lives. In the large area of what was then called Syria, the King Crane Commission had found out that 80% of the population preferred an American mandate, if any, and only 20% were in favor of the British. In Iraq, the British colonial authorities prevented the King Crane Commission from carrying out its surveys. As the Paris Peace Conference was about to convene in January of 1919, Iraqi leaders opposed to British occupation started writing petitions to the major powers, especially to the President of the United States. Sheikh Mohammed Taqi al-Shirazi, the spiritual leader of the Iraqi Shia sect, sent two letters dated February 13, 1919, one to President Wilson, another to the U.S. Ambassador in Iran. Al-Shirazi reminded the U.S. Ambassador of the principles of self-determination to which the U.S. administration had committed itself and informed him that the Iraqi people were seeking the aid of the United States to establish an independent Arab Islamic State. He alerted the ambassador to the fact that the Iraqi people were reluctant to express their views on the issue of the mandate due to, quote, the martial laws that have put them under siege from all sides, unquote, and that, quote, people do not trust the alleged right to free expression of opinions, unquote, touted by the British. These petitions fell on deaf ears, and the British launched a massive military campaign against the Iraqis, Shia, Sunni, and Kurds, who rose in a revolt against British suppression and cruelty. The revolt was crushed by August, leaving more than 10,000 Iraqis dead from bombings. By British, by the British Royal Air Force, which even used chemical weapons against Kurdish villages. Interesting. Interesting how, what was, was it Goering who said, you know, accuse your enemy of that which you were guilty? So they recycle these war crimes and attribute them to uh, leaders of independence that they wish to undermine later on. Um, between late 1919 and late 1920, Revolts and acts of resistance against the British, French, and Italian colonialists spread from Afghanistan to Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and North Africa, and were all suppressed with mass murder and extreme brutality. How the British play the game. Let's play, let's play co close attention here. 
The case of Syria is exemplary because it shows how the British played this game whose consequences we still suffer, we suffer still today. While the British were dividing up the remains of Europe's sick man, the Ottoman Empire together with the French in 1916 through the Sykes-Picot Agreement, even though the war was still simmering, they promised the Jews of Britain a homeland in Palestine, the heart of the region through the Balfour Declaration, a formal promise made by British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour in November 1917 to Lord Walter Rothschild and other Zionists such as Chaim Weizmann. They were at the same time nourishing their promises to the Sharif Hussein of Mecca. Let me read that again. They were at the same time nourishing their promises to the Sharif Hussein of Mecca to help him establish a, quote, great Arab state throughout the region and the Arabian Peninsula if he continued to help Britain to drive the Ottomans out of Arabia. The promises were made to Sharif Hussein, the great-grandfather of the current King of Jordan, by the British High Commissioner in Egypt, Sir Henry McMahon, the Hussein McMahon correspondence. In parentheses there, quote unquote. The Sharif was regarded as a religious leader, a descendant of the family of Prophet Muhammad and guardian of the holy Kaaba in Mecca, the most sacred site in Islam, whose word is a letter of credit among Arab tribes and Muslims in many parts of the world. When the war was over and the Sharif and his sons came to cash the promissory note, they were led into a labyrinth of deceptive moves and lies. Not only that, the very ground that the Sharif was standing on in Western Arabia was promised by the British to their most important asset, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, who had taken over most of Eastern Arabia by the end of the war with British military and financial aid. So we find lessons learned. The British are simply recycling the divide and conquer strategies of the Venetians who felt very much at a disadvantage uh, power-wise, but who made up for it by being um, completely unscrupulous and extremely clever in uh, playing people off one another to achieve supremacy, to achieve any amount of advantage. And uh, that's a whole other history, how the, how the Venetian methods were transplanted into uh, the British Empire. Uh, when, going on, when the Arabian armies under the leadership of Sharif Hussein's son, Prince Faisal and T.E. Lawrence of Arabia, Lawrence of Arabia, finally arrived in Damascus, Syria, in October 1918, and the people rejoiced for the removal of the Ottoman oppression, they did not think about the French colonial army advancing from the Mediterranean coast to take over that country in accordance with the Sykes-Picot Agreement. From that moment on, the British and Lawrence, who had befriended Faisal, took him through a smoke and mirrors game in order to get him to approve both the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the Balfour Declaration. Lawrence accompanied his dupe Faisal to allegedly represent the Arab nations at the Paris Peace Conference. In 1919, in January 1919, but before going to Paris, Lawrence led the prince to London, where the British government arranged for him to meet on the 3rd of June with Chaim Weizmann, chairman of the Zionist Congress. Under pressure from Lawrence Faisal, who was unable to contact his father, Sharif Hussein, capitulated to demands to sign an agreement with Weizmann to facilitate the immigration of Jews from Europe to Palestine and to accept the terms of the Balfour Declaration. Faisal made these concessions with an eye to the upcoming Paris Peace Conference, where he and his family would finally get the promised Arab land. Faisal was not allowed to get anywhere close to the conference. Oh, period, sorry. Uh, terrible, sorry guys. Let me read that again. F 
Faisal made these concessions with an eye to the upcoming Paris Peace Conference where he and his family would finally get the promised Arab land. Faisal was not allowed to get anywhere close to the conference halls, which were reserved for the European powers. Lawrence of Arabia suddenly was relieved of his duties, and Faisal returned to Syria empty-handed to find the French running the place. Arab Syrian officers and nationalist leaders founded a, quote, independence party in Damascus, most probably encouraged by the American King Crane Commission. In November 1919, Faisal, now leader of Syria, reached a compromise solution with the French government of Georges Clemenceau under pressure from the British, allowing the French to occupy the coastal areas and giving the French a monopoly over the economic affairs of the country. In March 1920, the Independence Party declared independence and the first revolt um, what was that? What was that? Oh, and the first revolt was a fact. A second revolt took place against the French army in June 1925. Both were crushed with merciless force. The Winston Hiccup. By that time, 1925, Prince Faisal of Syria had already left the country and was now King Faisal of Iraq upon recommendation of Colonial Secretary Winston Churchill. Faisal was crowned King of Iraq in August 1921. Churchill was sent to the region by the British government of David Lloyd George to devise a new strategy for the empire there after the expensive, quote-unquote, expensive armed revolts. The new strategy created by Churchill in the 1921 Cairo conference was to move from the British East India Company's direct imperial rule into the Foreign Office's indirect imperial control by installing puppet governments in the region bound by treaty agreements to the British Empire. So this is how it's done, essentially. Uh, an exemplary modern version of this type of treaty agreement is the British-Saudi multi-billion dollar A Al Yamama arms deal, which I have to look into that. Faisal's brother Abdullah was made king of the newly created Transjordan by Churchill, Faisal's father was deposed from his Hashemite throne in Al-Hijaz by the British-supported Ibn Saud in 1924 and sent into exile aboard a British steamer. The French carved greater Lebanon out of Syria. The absurdity of the Sykes-Picot engineering of borders between Arab countries reached its peak with the, quote, Winston Hiccup. Legend has it that Winston Churchill, after a huge dinner and many glasses of wine, was drawing the borders between his new creation, Transjordan, and Saudi Arabia with a pen. According to this tale, a hiccup caused the odd zigzag shape of the eastern border between Jordan and Saudi Arabia. No war has been waged between Jordan and Saudi Arabia on this question, but fires are still burning in many parts of South Asia, India and Pakistan and Southwest Asia due to the British imperial schemes. This is no mere history. It is a living tragedy today. If humankind manages to rise above this tragedy and bury what Lyndon LaRouche has termed the brutish empire, we will have many such stories and jokes to tell our children and grandchildren and laugh heartily at the folly of our predecessors. Let us hope. So, it's really astonishing to me how few people are, are aware of this. And 
uh, people who are aware of it perhaps are reluctant for some peculiar, strange, mysterious reason to try to connect the awareness of this history to what might be going on today in terms of uh, real-time guidance from London, from the Crown. Um, my sense is that situation in Ukraine, situation in Israel are connected. It's part of a world war scheme. And uh, to my mind, um, Charles III is at the head of this. Um, at least that's, that's what I can see on, on the surface. There's probably deeper layers. There's probably some Venetian uh, or some black nobility families that have, you know, certainly the, the House of Windsor is infiltrated by some very dark, very powerful players that have their origins in Rome and Venice. And uh, I haven't been able to penetrate more deeply, but I'm more deeply than Charles III. But it's interesting to me how people are, even uh, so-called people who identify with uh, wanting to uh, pursue truth at all, at all costs, they, they feel, there's a sense of like an allergy or an aversion. They want to back away from going, from as they say, from going there. But uh, I have no such reluctance. And I think anybody who is honest with themselves, however painful it is to part, for, to part with uh, the particular brand of prejudice or hatred or chauvinism, whatever it is they have now, to look back objectively and then to draw and to say, well, look, you know, British manipulation obviously didn't just evaporate. It's probably stronger than ever. There's a great documentary on YouTube called The Spider's Web, and it's about the British financial empire and how the British empire didn't just fade into oblivion, that it exerts control through a financial network, uh, that it has, its claws are even more steely than in the, in the not-so-distant past. So uh, let's keep our eyes and ears open. For signs of this, uh, I have, there are other articles that show that, uh, like the, the Hamas connections in London, offices in London, and uh, the British Foreign Office, Br British intelligence being very cagey when people point to this. Very cagey, elusive, evasive, hostile, defensive. So, to me, it's a no-brainer. I know what's going on. I have no aversion to calling it out. I just am not sure exactly the mechanics, and I'm not sure if there's darker forces uh, behind this, behind the Windsors. Anyway, all right.